person produces testosterone, this doesn't respond to it. In this particular case, you have no gonads whatsoever. You don't produce testosterone at all. So you stay very much template female. And because of the fact that estrogen comes from the gonads and can be made from testosterone, you don't grow breasts either. So you're basically a, you have almost no secondary sex characteristics, no breasts, um, no facial hair, nothing. You're just basically template sort of female, but you have male chromosomes, but no gonads, no ovaries. You can't reproduce. It's, it's a bad day if you want to reproduce if you have Squire syndrome. Mm -hmm. Typically, they, they give you um, estrogen and progesterone because, again, they're basing on external genitalia. They're saying that your brain didn't get testosterone, you're not wired for testosterone, you're, you don't look like you're a male. So the, the idea is that they can put you on a female track and that'll stick. But again, the brain's been wired the way it was wired during development. Going back and, and, and giving the brain mass amounts of estrogen later doesn't fix how the brain is wired. You can't make a non-gendered person into a gendered person by putting more hormones in them. It's almost like baking a cake and leaving the egg out. You take that flat cake out of the oven, you put egg on it, and stir it up, right. and hope it, hope it looks like a cake again. But you know, if you forget to put yeast in a bun, it's not going to rot. You can't put yeast in later and have it fixed. And that's the nature of... In, in development, like going back to the earlier slide, it's like a row of dominoes. And once dominoes don't fall, you can't go back and fix it. The structures are built, the brain's wired, the hypothalamus is built, and you can't go back. You can, you can maybe, if the person especially is receptive to it, wants to be more girly, especially with estrogen development, you may induce breast growth, which might be a good thing if you have a shallow vagina and no testicles. You know, you will begin to induce secondary sex characteristics. But again, the brain may not uptake that hormone very well because you don't have a female brain. You have a non-male brain. And back to AIS. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Go back so we saw an earlier um, example of AIS. This is, um, again, you can see there's a 46 XY male. The occurrence is 1 in 20,000. Um, as I mentioned earlier, genetic defects results in the ability to respond to testosterone. And the external genitalia has a female appearance. So basically, again, you have a shallow vagina, no, no uh, significant penis, and but actually you can actually have partial AS, which we'll get to in a second. But basically, when you're born, it's a girl until you don't menstruate at 16, and you can't get pregnant, and you're not fertile. And there are a lot of rumors about famous people who have adopted children who are probably AIS. I'm not going to name names. You can do research on the internet. <laughs> Let's see. No reason. The question is: Is, is this the third sex? This person is a male, but has no ability to reproduce. So from a biological reproductive point of view, what sex are they? They can't reproduce. Partial AIS is basically you're born an XY male, you have a genetic defect, but you don't completely not respond to testosterone. So your penis will be very short. And, you, and maybe you're, you still have a vaginal opening, but maybe you're partially closed. So there's actually, I think, five grades of AIS. Most people talk about complete AIS because it's interesting because we see a woman who's perfectly happy. She's never seen testosterone from a mental point of view. She knows she's a woman. You know, because imagine if you were a boy and you're in the womb and you never got a whiff of testosterone. You never understood what it was. And your brain's basically left alone to be a female brain. You wake up, you come out of the womb and it's like, I'm female because I don't know any better. You know, you've never been exposed to testosterone. You don't know what being a man is. Mm -hmm. So it makes perfect sense that a person who has complete AIS would be perfectly happy being female because she knows not of anything else. The problem is, is partial AIS is a real problem. I know one person, personally, who has partial AIS. He's very embarrassed about his small penis, his confused gender identity. And in that case, it's not a happy picture because we look at men as, you know, you're manly if you have a big schlong and you have <laughs> lots, of, lots of women to have sex with. Um, but in his case, because his penis is so smart, he's sure he's been embarrassed his whole life and he's had very difficult time relationships. But we don't talk about that. It doesn't make good fodder for Oprah, some poor guy with a short dick. You know, it just, it just doesn't make people, oh, I'm sorry. You know, but partially, or completely I ask, like, look, a happy woman, yay. You know, but there are a lot of people out there who suffer partial AIS and really have a lot of mental problems about society saying you should be manly, but genetically they can't be. They, they don't have a lot of body hair, they don't have a lot of muscle mass, and they have a very small penis. They are half-baked men, and they're stuck in the middle. And, and society just basically says, you're just not man enough, too bad. You know, it's, it's really sad what we do. Going back to your question about the, the, um, the breast development, when you have complete AIS, 
you still have internal gonads. They haven't descended, and you generate lots of testosterone, just like any other normal man would. But because you're doing a defect, the secondary sex characteristics, facial hair, muscle bulk, all that, don't take place. So all that extra testosterone through a couple combination processes becomes a hormone like estrogen, which then your breast tissue responds, and you grow a breast. This person has complete ass. Outwardly, you would not know if this is genetically a man. There's a normal breast produced by testosterone converted to estrogen and has a shallow vagina. And as far as she's concerned, she's a woman until she didn't have a period and found out she was infertile. And then genetic testing would prove that she was a man. Mm -hmm. um, how deep is considered a shallow vagina? It depends. Um, can be anywhere from two to four inches. Okay. And then with, with regular stretching and dilation, you can get to a point of having a normal size vagina yeah. or have surgery done if you have AIS and you want to have a deeper vagina, they can do surgery to take a skin graft. And, and I'm assuming that there's no cervix at the end of the no, canal, there's not. and so no. it's just cinched just, yeah. after his right Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, Feinfelter syndrome, that's again, when you have an extra sex chromosome, occurs in 1 in 1,000 males. Um, typically, the male sex organs are underdeveloped, so you produce a lot less testosterone. You don't fully virilize. It tends to be smaller, less facial hair, less body hair, less virilized overall. And they typically are considered the raised male, because you do have typically have a penis. In most cases, they say about 80% of the XXY people are happy being men. Now, I don't know if that's skewed because society wants to be that way, but for the most part, only 10% of XXYs actually become transitioning females. And, and again, if you look at the chromosome pattern, if the X, XX pair were to express itself more heavily, that person would tend to feel more feminine. If the XY pair were to express itself more, that person would feel more masculine. But again, I, I, I know a person I'm pretty sure was XXY, and, and she was a mess. Uh, and you can see why. You, you've got these fighting chromosomes. You basically have developmental disorders that also result in mental disorders as well. Typically, what they do, and this goes back to the egg and the cake thing, is they, if they give people who don't make enough testosterone more testosterone. So when you hit 12, you're not shooting up, you're not having a lot of body hair, they say, well, let's just give them testosterone and give them some facial hair, and they'll feel much better with a full beard and a big, bulky body. Yeah. Yeah, like one of my son's best friends has a, is XXY. So okay. I've seen him grow up somewhat. I mean, he's, my son's only 12, he's actually um, a year and a half older. So I've watched him through puberty. Um, and actually, uh, and I did some research because, you know, actually everyone in the class, we were told that, you know, we weren't sure if he was going to have a hard time uh, going through puberty and that we were, we were encouraged to do some research and make sure we were sensitive and all that stuff. So I did a lot of research on it. And they, he got very, very tall, actually. Um, and I read that that was somewhat common. Very, very thin, very tall, some breasts. I mean, he's like a he looks like a supermodel. <laughs> yeah. But um, they, the, and the parent, the, the mother is a psychiatric nurse, so they didn't want to do anything with hormones at all. They just wanted to um, kind of let him be overall. But um, he kind of, I don't know, it was odd. I mean, he was like almost hyper macho in some way, but like, it, it's very interesting. The voice got higher instead of lower. I mean, it was, it's been interesting. I mean, just, I don't have any profound observations, but it's, it's totally different. You know, like mm -hmm. just going through puberty was just totally different. Um, and all these kind of unexpected things well, again, happen. you have a potential fighter because you may and have... And I know testicles, like raisins, like the testicles mm -hmm. look but a penis, so... They're very common. Yeah. So, so a good example of yeah. one X, X, Y, someone knows. I mean, again, these people are out there in society, and for the most part, they're put in, in the shadows in the closet, and they're, they're special people. They're just different people. Mm -hmm. But society doesn't know how to deal with something that we don't know what it is. Because, again, in 47 X, X, Y, Every 47 XXY is different because gene expression will always choose whatever it wants. And in this particular case, very different from my, my friend, um, but, but interesting in similarities. And then everybody can, you know, you can make a lot of testosterone, but it's still a female brain, depending on which gene expresses itself. So, you know, if someone's gender confused, that's when it happens, basically, that the brain is looking for estrogen from the XY pair, or the XX pair, but the XY pair made some testicles that are, that are making testosterone. So again, gender confusion tends to result and people are very unhappy or have schizophrenia or whatever. So it's very difficult to manage this and sometimes we treat it as behavior problems, but look at what they're dealing with, you know? And, and no one knows what to call that because everyone's different. It's like you break the mold every time. You know, you get blonde hair and blue eyes and then XXY, you get male and female, it just like, you know, doing a Dairy Queen swirl. You mix it all up and see right. what comes out. Yeah. <laughs> um, I remember when I learned about this stuff in school, they also used to call them like 
super male and super female? Or well, there's also XXXs, yeah. which I didn't talk about. Oh, okay. That's another, another variant where you can have super males. And it's another variant. And also you can have XYYs, XXYYs. You know, there's about 16 different known combinations of the sex chromosome plus mosaics where you have a mixing of them. Um, I picked about five of the more common ones here. Um, and this is your favorite, yeah. my favorite too. Tetragamatic chimeras mm -hmm. um, basically results from the fusion of two fertilized eggs. So if you have a parent that's heavy in twins or has a very large litter in the case of cats and mice, mm -hmm. you see it's a lot. Basically, you have the two fertilized eggs that are floating around with that free forming zygotes and they refuse. But all that bonded genetic material, be it male and female, male, male, blonde hair, blue eyes, whatever, is now in a crock pot and they blend together and get stirred up again. So you can actually have the blue eye from this person, the brown eye from that, that person, express itself in one uniform person. In the case of where you have a lot of twins, like in my particular, my mother has a lot of twins on her sides, and I've got some interesting skin patching, which is reminiscent of chimeras as well. So I don't know, it could be all kinds of things. It's a crock pot of genetics, I guess. <laughs> um, so this is um, a couple of examples. Cats, again, they have a litter of six. So in this particular case, two kittens got together and formed Two individual, <laughs> one single individual. So obviously there was a black cat and an orange tabby that snuggled up the zygotes and it became one cat and there's a blue eye and a, and a green eyed cat that the green eye is the green eye from his sister or his brother. It's a genetic material from that other zygote. Yeah. So if you actually tested genetic material from let's say the oh, yeah. eye, it's, it's yeah, completely different. Yeah, there's two different. people there. Really? So yeah. it's yeah. So all cats that have two different yeah. colored eyes chimeras? Yeah. Like uh, David, it's David Bowie. No. I think it's our contact lenses there, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. question? So, so there was a, a program on TLC called I Am My Own Twin. Right? Yes, and I, yeah. can, I can play the whole story unless you want to. Um, no, but if you're interested in learning more about it, it's... In the case you're speaking of, there was a woman who needed a kidney transplant, and one of the best donors they thought would be one of her sons. And they found out that two of her three sons didn't match her genetic material. That basically she had two ovaries, and the two of her sons came from this ovary, and one of her sons came from that ovary. This ovary was her sister's ovary. So two of her sons came from her sister's ovary because she was the fusion of her sister's twin, or her, twin, her twin sister. So that's why that happened. So they had to, they actually, they actually argued with her that two of her kids weren't hers, and that case blew the whole chimera thing open in human beings. That up until then, genetic testing really wasn't around until they proved that. And then all of a sudden, we start to see more and more interest in chimeras. And actually, I think I have the next slide here. No, I guess I didn't. I actually thought that was on the previous slide there. Yeah, medical and legal issues. There's also been cases where, in rape case, if a man were to rape a woman, and they were to get a sperm sample, and then do a blood test from that person, the sperm may have been from his brother. So he could get off with the rape case, because they didn't take his sperm, they took his blood which was his brother's blood, not his mother's brother's sperm. So it has legal issues. Yeah. So um, once the eggs fuse and they split, they're still twins, but one twin may have other twins? No, you're talking about um, identical twins. That doesn't happen with identical twins. I'm talking about fraternal twins. Oh, okay. Two okay. unique individuals, okay. brown hair, blue eyes, brown hair, you know, green, green eyes. eyes, and they get back together and they say, we're gonna get rid of these two eyes and keep these two eyes. And typically, if you actually look up oh, uh, okay. dynamic chimeras, you can see skin patterning that looks a lot like the cat, where there's distinct lines of division. And this basically is right. clearly that there was two things that formed there. Right. And typically it comes in like a mix, mix match mosaic all the way down the back. Okay. And in people, you can see these patches of color that go okay. through the body. And it's almost again like a Dairy Queen smoothie where you mix it all up. And the skin is actually half and half of mm -hmm. the two being fused together. And depending on at what point, the two zygotes refuse, you get different color in the skins, and, and again, gene expression reflects um, you know, the eyes or the you know, God knows what. Right. Or you can actually have duplicate organs. In the case of a true hermaphrodite, you can have a man outwardly with a sister's uterus inside of him because that those genes start to express themselves. The material was there, and somehow it all figured out. There's actually a person in India, his brother's foot's growing out of him. Oh, yeah. And he yeah, chose to keep the foot because it said that's the only part of my brother that I still know, and they were going to surgery to remove it. But he's like 21 years old and has a foot in him. And there's also been a case in the where they, they had a gentleman, he had an entire fetus inside of him. His brother was, they had like two pounds of hair oh, yeah, and, and yeah, kind of partially formed fetus.
Cletus was all, and he yeah. carried it around with him until he was 20. And they thought it was a big cyst, and they took it out, and it was like, you know, a half made fetus that was still living inside of him that had just never come to maturity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, depending on what point those two zygotes refuse, you can get a partially formed fetus, or you can just get a blending of material that, that results in a, in a uniform single person with just some interesting um, divisions in their genetics. Okay, so that's um, basically um, the basis of. Yeah. Yeah, um, they, did you find that they have any of the same kind of mental with schizophrenia or anything like that when trying to use those two? We have to ask one. There's okay. very little no, research. The only sense time. about the mid 90s how we had the ability to actually measure genetic material to the point to actually uncover this. And for the most part, most chimeras go undiscovered and live normal lives, maybe with two different color eyes or whatever. Um, and if they have mental problems, they drink themselves silly, they take antidepressants, <laughs> and, and we don't even begin to look at, is it genetic in all the chimeras? Because it, it can be very difficult to determine because what organ, what tissue do you test for? You know, are you going to get a biopsy of each kidney and see if that's your brother's kidney or not? It's, right. it's, it's yeah. tough. Okay. But typically if you see skin modeling, mm -hmm. you know, patches of skin that clearly, you know, look like there's two different things going on here, it might be a good indication. But other than that, um, well, short of eye color and body patches, there's no external way of telling that there's two people there. Unless you have a flip growing out of you, it's pretty yeah. obvious then. And then secondly, for your partial AIS, uh -huh. um, they have a good common to be unable to reproduce? Yeah, the spermogenesis is greatly reduced, and typically they're infernal. Gotcha. And they have a small penis anyway, so right. even that alone makes it difficult to get penetration, unless of course with a sperm sample and you do it in vitro. Okay, so um, there's other things besides nature that can cause section and gender variance. Endocrine disruptive chemicals are my favorite. Um, I've listed five here, DEF, dioxin, UDE, atrazine, and biphenyl A. Mm -hmm. um, DEF was first synthesized back in 1938. It actually is a very powerful synthetic estrogen, and the FDA approved it for prevention miscarriage. <laughs> It was supposed to basically make really strong babies and help in the delivery process, and basically um, five to 10 million people were exposed to the 4171. So basically a lot of your mothers could have been exposed, or even you could have, depending on how old you are. I certainly am in that category, so I was born in 63. So um, my mother could have been given DES to help me become a healthy baby. Unfortunately, DES is a very powerful estrogen, and we thought back in those days that the placenta was a perfect filter. You could give a mother alcohol and she could smoke and she'd have a good time and the baby wouldn't care. Uh, unfortunately, that's not true. A lot of things do pass through the placenta and in this particular case, um, in men, it, it led to hypostasis. Basically, you know, the urinary tract opening happens everywhere from the base of the penis all the way to the top of the shaft. And of course, down the base of the penis is much more feminine and towards the top of the shaft is much more masculine. Um, and this is not, you know, another physical example of how a hormone exposure in, in vitro can cause a physical manifestation. And to ignore this physical manifestation and to ignore the brain is really a crime because we think that we can just go in and fix this and have some plumbing and, and we fix the problem. But if you have a hypospadias to base your penis, that means you've been exposed to a lot of estrogen at early on in development and the brain's probably as much feminized as your penis is. So no one ever takes that into account. We think we can just structurally fix this and life goes on. In the case of daughters, DEF's daughters, a lot of those people have a very cancer, cervical cancer, uh, pregnancy problems. So this wonder drug the FDA approved um, caused a lot of problems. And this is something that the FDA approved. This isn't even an environmental contaminant. This is us being stupid. You know, we thought we could just give a mother lots of estrogen and maybe be fine. So, you know, for 30 or 40 years, there's been generations and generations of people with cancer, behavior problems, developmental disorders, all because of one chemical that we thought was a good idea. Of course, we've banned it now. But that exposure, the, the history of that, gives a very good window into what happens when you have synthetic chemical exposures that aren't prescribed medicines. Dioxin is one of them. Um, it comes from the bleaching of paper, from incineration of PVC. It basically mimics the effects of estrogen. So again, it's another chemical, but the body's not very selective. If you have one in a molecule that looks like estrogen, it can care less what the rest of the molecule looks like, as long as it fits the receptor. And that's the problem is, you know, 200 years ago or 2,000 years ago, there was no synthetic estrogen environment, so the body could choose 
not to be selected because there wasn't synthetic estrogens out in the environment. Now there are, and we haven't evolved enough to be able to determine what's really estrogen and what's a chemical pollutant. Mm. Well, according to the, the whole thing about the oxen, the reason why I know so much about it is I'll get to a little math here. I was born in the red spot there. So if you um, want to have a baby, don't eat meat and dairy from Wisconsin. It's full of dioxin. Um, actually, right now, if you go to Wisconsin's fish and game guide, you can still not fish in certain rivers because of dioxin exposure in fish. They, they actually recommend it. it says, do not eat dioxin. Um, basically, there was so much runoff from the uh, pulp mills and paper mills and bleaching and textile industry that's all running the Lake Michigan, that whole area is contaminated. And this is a persistent organic pollutant that stays there for 30 plus years and it bioaccumulates. So, you know, the, the fish eat it, we eat it, and, and it builds up to the food chain. The birds eat it, and it basically builds up in the fat of animals. So, if you get dairy or meat, and that basically is fat, and most milk is, comes from fat. Um, so, all the bioaccumulation gives you a great way to destroy all the oxygen. So if you want to detoxify your body, have a baby. Because that's what happens is you've been eating all this cheese, it builds up in your fat tissue, and you have a baby, you metabolize all that fat, and guess where it all goes? It goes in your baby. Oh, no. So, you know, cheese you ate 10 years ago that came from Wisconsin that had a pesticide in it, you could be giving your baby when you're pregnant 10 years later because that, that molecule still stayed there. You know, these POPs don't break down very easily. Um, oh yeah, I forgot the little, no, don't do that. Yeah, um, the, this whole story about dioxin is back in 1991, George Bush Sr. Um, started a, an EPA research into the effect of dioxin. Basically, it was supposed to prove that the chemical industry was not responsible for anything. And 10 years went by, it was heavily funded by Bill Clinton, and 2001 the report came out, and George Bush Sr. was not this. Mm -hmm. Guess what that report is right now, all 2,000 pages of it. It's sitting in the EPA. It's been going between the um, international, the, the health community, the, the Academy of Sciences people, the <laughs> cigarette lobby. Because all, all the very same people who lobby for keeping cigarettes on the shelves are lobbying to keep this report. Because they're all funded by lobbyists, chemical industry lobbyists. They're all lawyers who basically are heavily funded to let you not know that in one line of the report it says criminally feminized. And since I grew up there, and I was born there, that, that line is, is very true, going back to the whole, the old baking the cake thing. If you're exposed to a synthetic estrogen, or DES, in vitro, that sticks with you. It, it, it blocks virilization, it adds to your self, it, it's an extra, it's like putting high-end pepper in a, in a brownie, you know, and it stays there, you bake it, and it's like, wow, these brownies are really spicy. You know, it's a little, 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 little added extra in it. So it's very interesting how and I've met a lot of people, and, and we can talk about this, how a male who's been blocked from testosterone is different than a male who's been given estrogen. And, and, I, and I fully believe that I've been a male given estrogen. But I know a person, I'll get to in a minute, who was exposed to an androgen blocker. So, but actually, if you read the AP report, it's all, it's all online EPA. And the EPA says, do not quote or cite, not official release. And they were actually nice when they put all 2,000 pages up. And since decades of research, about how bad dioxin is. It causes diabetes, it causes um, feminization issues, all kinds of stuff. Wow. It's pretty scary stuff. And, and it's basically still in the environment years later. And the, most of the people who are talking about it now will say two things. The levels have dropped dramatically. Well, they have since 1970. We've cleaned up a lot of it, but a lot of us still have in our body fat. The other thing is, is that the, the levels are below the cancer threshold. Well, great, we're not going to cancer from this stuff. The problem is, is that the body responds to very low level of hormones. You know, you cannot get cancer from something, and you can make a transsexual baby with a lot less potential. So when they say that you're not going to get cancer, is diabetes better? Is being a transsexual better? You know, you're not causing cancer, you know, and that's a make for a great sound bite. The other thing is, is you can't prove anything. That's the other, other line they use a lot. Well, the only way you can prove anything scientifically is to take 100 months for a pregnant, get them all dioxin, and see if 10% of them have transsexual babies. That's scientific proof. But if you look at birds, rats, fish, alligators, the whole marine aquatic environment, what's going on in areas where dioxin is heavily contaminated, you see the same effects. And they also repeat in the laboratory. But they will say, well, you didn't do human studies, so you can't prove anything. 
The evidence is very clear. Dioxin is a very powerful estrogen. It acts just like DGF does, and it's in the environment. It's going to be here for 30 plus years. Um, dichloro, diphenyl, dichloroethylene, better known as DDE. Um, this is a component of DDT production. Um, we still make DDT here, we just don't use it here because, again, it's another powerful persistent organic pollutant. We spread tons of it in Africa to control malaria. I guess they figured having transsexuals is better than having malaria. Um, it does pass the placenta. It is also treated in breast milk. There was a very large spill of this product in 1980 in Lake Apopka, Florida. I'm actually from Florida. I lived there for 12 years. And I happen to know the story because um, in my research of endocrine disruptors, there's been a lot of talk about studying the alligators who have all have small penises. And that basically reinforces the effects of an anti-androgen. Basically, during the domino falling process, you kick out a few dominoes and the virilization process doesn't happen. You interfere with the expression of genes, interfere with the hormones that can cause male structures. And this is pretty recent. And there's actually been a number of accidents like this that have had big spills of known endocrine disruptors. And this is actually one of the news articles about the um, D.D. Um, Louis Juliet, he's a professor at one of the Florida universities who's heavily studied this and written many papers on it. But if you're interested in um, this, it's a good study and, and again, a lot of research um, on the effects on the aquatic environment of the endocrine structure. Um, Atrazine is another one. It's a very common um, herbicide we use here. Um, when sperm counts, um, it's been banned in Europe, but we applied 37 million pounds of it in 2003, and in 2006, under a EPA controlled by other people who aren't very friendly to people. Um, they said no harm would come to result the US population if it's children. Um, but if that's the case, why was it banned in Europe? <laughs> and again, it causes denationalization, fraudulent concentration. Again, well below the cancer threshold. So I, I guess it's okay having a short penis as long as you don't have cancer with a short penis. <laughs> Life in LA, it's been in the news a lot. Um, this was actually discovered back in the 30s as a very potent estrogen. And they actually thought about using this as a, as a um, synthetic estrogen to actually, actually be treatment, much, much like um, other estrogens are prescribed, but they basically found it to be better in plastics. But because it's been used so much and we have exposure to it with water bottles and everything else, um, the nature of this, the effects of it became clear, and we began to wonder again, with all the understanding of what happened to the placenta of the experience with DPS, a lot of people raised red flags about this because we were seeing some trending in the ovarian cancer rate, breast cancer rate, things of that nature where people were exposed to biphenyl A, and given that this was known to be a very potent estrogen back in the 1930s, it really makes you wonder how much synthetic estrogen is in this water bottle right now has leached out of the container that it was in. And that's why the big deal, because when you're developing as a fetus, a very small amount of a hormone can make a big difference. It's like when you're tracking a spacecraft, you nudge a little bit. Once it travels for a few million miles, it's way out here if you nudge it a little bit. And that's what happens when you're only a few cells trying to figure out what you are, and you nudge those cells a little bit, you can get a whole different result. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with um, stating it's below the cancer threshold. It's not below the transsexual threshold. And there's the paper in 2008, um, the National Toxicity Program here in this country has decided to study biophenol in 2008, even though we've known it's potent estrogen for almost 100 years. Mm -hmm. So in the end, sex chromosomes indicate what you could be, not what you are. Because of defects in chromosomes, chemicals, you can really affect the course of development. So saying that someone has XY chromosomes or XX chromosomes means absolutely nothing to 2% of the population because of genetic issues.